uh, privilege of introducing our keynote speaker for today. Um, so I have been, I guess, working in Linux for about five years, and I remember uh, the first patch that I sent to NetDev. It was actually received packet steering. And I didn't know what I was doing. I, I just sent the patch. We'd actually had it running for a while. It looked pretty good to me. So I sent it uh, on NetDev. And this guy responds, and he's like, why would we need this? We have this in hardware. It's completely useless. Go away. <laughs> so his name was Dave Miller. And so I get this, and I'm like, what a jerk. I mean, he doesn't know anything about this. So I did the, did the wise thing. I went and I looked under documentation, read about how to submit a patch, learned about persistence, um, the idiosyncrasies of maintainers somehow. Got some good, uh, good guidelines on that. So. Um, we worked through that and, and um, got the patches in and some more patches and things like that. And since then, I learned a few things um, about Dave. So one, I, I don't comprehend how he handles this workload. It's amazing. It's so many patches coming in and he looks at all of them, uh, has knowledge across all of the networking subsystem, can knows the details about everything. So um, that's just incomprehensible to me. And it's just amazing. But one of the side effects of that is that you know, we leverage that. And we're getting a lot of benefit out of that. So that's uh, super important. One of the other things I learned, and I think he admits this, if you meet Dave personally, uh, it's easier to get your patches in. <laughs> so. Um, that's why I think conference like this is just awesome. To have uh, FaceTime with Dave actually helps a lot. Um, but the third thing, and probably most important, that I've learned is he's just actually a nice guy. Uh, genuinely, genuinely nice. Um, really is interested in what we're doing, the technology. And I think his goal, his purpose, really is to facilitate moving us forward, um, getting the internet to move forward, actually. So, you know, I view it as considering the whole intranet and the value of Linux to it and the value of the networking stack to Linux. To me, this is like one of the critical pieces of, of the whole intranet, the whole world. So it's not insignificant, uh, your contributions. Um, but with that, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our network maintainer, illustrious leader, Dave Miller. Is this on? Yes, it is. So first of all, I don't think I can live up to the expectations that have just been set forward by Mr. Herbert. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk about some important topics. One is what I think is the feature of the year, uh, to, to be quite blunt. And the other is something that we need to think really hard about whether we want to do or not, and is more of a controversial, kind of not so straightforward issue. So, okay. So let's talk about optimizations and where these optimizations occur. Where does packet processing occur? Why is this important? Um, so Linux has a really feature rich networking stack and you can do all kinds of things. You can do classification, you can mangle packets, you can have a million different ways of directing where the traffic goes by forwarding tables, by net filter rules, by mirrored actions and TC, anything. But this has a cost. And the cost is that you have to go all the way down into the networking stack and commit to the entire networking stack in order to get these features. And the call chains are quite deep sometimes. There's memory references. There's all this overhead. I mean, it's, it's, it's really a huge scope of, of what has to happen for all these features to be supported by the Linux uh, networking stack. And that's why it's so hard to test the networking stack completely, too. These two things go hand in hand. Um, so if you got rid of all that crap and you just went as low as you possibly could go, then you could reach the theoretical optimal level of performance. And, uh, but the thing is, once you go low, you lose all that, that stuff that we like to use in Linux. And theoretically, we lose generality, but not necessarily so. So how do we make the impossible, the seemingly impossible happen and enter XDP? So XDP is the express data path. What do you need to understand about this? So the idea is that XDP is a me mechanism by which to run eBPF programs. eBPF is the extension to the Berkeley packet filter, if you haven't heard about it yet, but 
where have you been if not? Uh, so but I'll explain a little bit about it. It's a general abstraction for processing. Uh, it, it executes bytecodes, and in the kernel we have various JITs to execute this bytecode. Another important aspect of BPF, and e, okay, when I say BPF, I'm going to mean eBPF, so you're just going to have to translate in your head while I'm talking for the rest of this slide. Um, we have JITs for BPF, which means that uh, we translate the BPF bytecodes into uh, CPU instructions, uh, which means it ex executes at CPU rate. Um, the other thing that's really important is the Restrict, restrictions we place upon BPF programs. This means that BPF executes in a sort of black box. It can't access arbitrary kernel memory. It can't do arbitrary things inside of the kernel. It, there's a set of things that it's allowed to do, and if it needs to do certain things, we have special helpers that BPF provides that the BPF program can call. There are restrictions on what kind of tables it can access and how those tables are set up. So if it wants to use data structures, it can, but only in a certain way. It's really important that you think that this is, this is an extra execution environment that it, it sits in a very tightly controlled black box, and that's really important. Um, so let's go back to how BPF applies to XTP. XTP executes right in the receive ring handler of the networking driver right as soon as the packet is pulled off the ring. There is no earlier point that we could do packet processing than where the XTP hook is. It is absolutely impossible to process the packet more quickly. This is exactly as deep as you possibly can go with it, with, uh, with hooks and execution of uh, packetized, packetized hand, packet handling. Um, the other thing that's really important about this, it, right after you pull the packet off the ring, we don't want to have the, the SK buff metadata. That's critically important as well. The location of the hook and the fact that we haven't committed to the metadata for the packet. The SK buff is huge, and any everyone in this room who's ever tried to add a member to SK buff will know that that's I'm going to shoot that patch down almost immediately. There would have to be I would, you would have to solve world peace to allow me for me to allow you to add another member to SK buff. That's how bad it's gotten. We've had cases in the past where I can even remember a case from 15 to 20 years ago that just adding one member dropped performance on IE64 on a simple benchmark by 20 to 30 percent. It's, it's serious business, and the flexibility of the, this, this, this thing I talked about earlier where you have to go all the way in and commit to the entire networking stack and the cost therein, the SK buff metadata is a part of that overhead as well. So that's another thing to consider. And what XTP does is it defines a very absolute minimum piece of metadata state to operate on packets when it, you execute the BPF instructions. This means you just get enough information to know where the packet data is and how long the buffer is. The other restriction is that the buffer is linear, which simplifies things as well. So we want the absolute minimal piece of metadata to operate upon because allocating metadata is part of the cost of using the whole networking stack. So, but realize that because BPF determines the way the packet is processed, this mechanism is completely generic. You can do what, people can do whatever they want with it. So why do we need this thing in the first place? So we absolutely must have an alternative to DPDK. DBK is not something we want to drive forward. DBDK is not Linux. You can quote me on this. DPDK, again, it's not Linux. Okay, everyone repeat with me. DPDK <laughs> is not Linux. Thank you. That's definitely going on YouTube somewhere. <laughs> Why is it not Linux? Well, this is important. It bypasses the Linux networking stack. It, it isn't an integral part of it. It doesn't work alongside of it. So once you use DPDK, none of the facilities of the Linux, net, Linux networking stack are available at all. It, it lives outside the realm of Linux completely. It requires third-party modules and licensing. That's not something we're all about either. It, has, you, it had to define its own security model for accessing the device outside of the kernel realm so that it could do its DPDK stuff. So we wanted to get away from this and we wanted to provide a way to solve the problems that people use DPDK for. People love all the performance numbers that come out of DPDK, but this is the cost you pay for that. We can get all of that without this side effect, and that's what XDP is all about. 
So I talked about the metadata. Here's what the metadata looks like. It's just a start and an end pointer. The eVPF program can look at the beginning of the packet and start parsing using the data member, and it knows that the packet goes until data end, and it can implement whatever it wants to do with the packet in that point. This means, as a side effect that must be understood, is that the packet is not read-only. The, the eVPF program can mangle the data, and this is useful for load balancing situations, for routing, for if you want to do fast NAT inside of X, uh, XDP. The packet is writable, and that has implications for what the drivers need to do and for performance. Um, so when a BPF program running under XDP is done and it's made a determination about what to do with the packet, it returns an action code. And the action codes defined right now are aborted, drop, pass, and transmit. So what do these four enumeration values mean? So drop means drop the packet, do not pass it up to the rest of the networking stack, and you can recycle that buffer back to the, to the hardware. That's the end. Aborted is, uh, and means that the, 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 some internal error happened in the BPF program, and currently we treat this like a drop. For example, why do we do it this way? Uh, it should be done this way because if your intention of a BPF program is to drop dangerous traffic, if the program has an error, you, we don't want to let dangerous traffic still go through the network. So the, the choice, for, and it, it's easy to argue the other way around. Some people would rather say, I'd rather not lose my legitimate traffic than, than this, right? Uh, the, other, the next code is pass, which means just accept the packet as we always did and put it all the way through the, the Linux networking stack. That's straightforward. It's behave as if uh, XDP was no longer, longer there. But keep in mind that the BPF program in the pass case, when it returns pass, it could decide to mangle the packet in some way. Okay, so it, do, it doesn't mean that BPF didn't do anything to the packet or change what would happen when the packets received. It just means that I've evaluated that you should pass the state of the packet it is now with an SKB up into the stack. That's all that that means. TX, it means currently transmit this packet out of the same interface it arrived on. So if you receive it on NIC0, transmit it out NIC0. Uh, so it's, and this is a, currently a limitation of uh, using the transmit feature, and I'll go into that later about what we intend to do in the future with that. But So how would you use this? The, the simplest example is DDS, DDoS mitigation. You have an ACL list with a couple hundred thousand IP addresses in it or subnets or whatever, and you put this into a BPF map. The XDP BPF program parses the packet, looks for the source address or whatever the key is that you use for your BPF map for your ACLs, looks it up in the table and gets a code result, one of those XDP enumerations or some internal value that you translate into the XDP return values. and if you found an entry in your ACL table, you return the drop code. And the, the packet buffer is returned to the hardware because of the drop code, and the packet never enters the stack. Uh, if it didn't find an entry in, the, in the, the BPF map, we'd return pass, which means pass it up to the stack. So that's how you could do DDoS mitigation. Another possible uh, Use case, and this explains uh, how the current TX mechanism could be used is static load balancing, or not necessarily static, but my example is a static load balancing. So you have an array or a table of some sort uh, that is uh, a list of servers that you want to load balance to uh, behind the machine. And you parse the packet, you pull out the, the lookup key, and, and you hash it, and then you index into your table of servers use that table to rewrite the IP headers and the MAC address, and then you return the TX code. The TX code tells the driver, transmit it out of the same uh, physical NIC that the packet arrived on, and don't pass it up into the stack. Okay? So that's how you might do load balancing with the TX feature. So I, I should tell you where this, where this kind of comes from. So what a lot of huge sites to run into, the problem they run into is they, they say, okay, when we're, we're, when we're starting small, we want to do load balancing, we use NetFilter, IPVS, and everything kind of goes along re decently fine for a little while. Then as traffic rates and demands get higher and higher, it just 
using the whole networking stack and going all the way into NetFilter and going all the way into IBVS just doesn't scale and doesn't provide the, the performance people want. You could do load balancing with BPF and BPF uh, maps using this as a low latency, very fast load balancing solution. People use DPDK for this too. Other people have found other solutions. Um, so what are the restrictions that uh, drive the design of XDP right now. So each packet buffer must fit in a single page. This is the primary area where changes are required in the drivers. Uh, the reason why it's like this is because the metadata we wanted to keep as simple as possible so that BPF programs don't have to deal with nonlinear buffers, scatter gather, or any of that complication. We want to eliminate that completely from the, from the, the realm of where these BPF programs have to understand. Um, Right now, when you install an XDP program on a device, it applies to all the received queues on the device. Uh, there's no mechanism currently to say, please execute this XDP program on receive Q3, and, and that's something we want to do in the future, and I'll get into that. Uh, transmit, as I discussed earlier, can only occur on the same device that the uh, XDP program uh, received the packet on. But where do we want to go from here? Uh, per RxQ XDP instances. So what's really the next level is almost all of these chips that have multiple received queues have filtering and classification hardware inside, which means that they could, you could tell the card, okay, everything on port 80 web traffic, put it to receive Q3. Therefore, if you had an XDP program that wanted to operate only upon web traffic, you could steer all of your traffic to We'll receive Q3 and only instantiate the XDP program on that receive Q3. Then the rest of your traffic would go to the other queues and wouldn't, have, wouldn't even try to execute the XDP program at all. And you could take this on even hot, further levels. For example, <clears throat> intrusion dis detection systems like Suricata have complicated rule bases, but at the top, there's a certain level of filtering that's going to occur before they want to do things. So, for example, you could, you could have a set, certain set of queues that apply to certain uh, sets of filtering rules and have different XDP programs that execute for those classes of traffic that the IDS is interested in. So the, the, the possibilities are endless once we start getting the chip involved in pre-filtering the traffic, pre-siloing the traffic that you're interested in for specific XDP programs. The next thing you want to do is you want to do forwarding to non-same interfaces. This is uh, interesting if you want, to do a, you want to do a bridge in XDP or you want to do a forward, a simple forwarding MG in F XDP. You need also a port table because for the bridging case, for example, you need to know the set of interfaces that are relevant because you might have, for example, a flood operation and you don't want to flood to every if index in the entire machine. You want to flood to the, the ports that are involved in the bridge that you're implementing with your XDP program. Okay. Um, there are other complications because once you leave the realm of the current driver, you may have to read DMA map to the page and unmap it from the current device. Um, the other thing is we've discussed about locking because one thing that's really nice right now is that the drivers try to stay to the, the only transmit with the XDBTX to the transmit queue that's assigned to the current CPU. Therefore, all the per CPU locking optimizations apply. And what we want to encourage is that everyone that supports XDP with this stuff applies the same rule so that we could eliminate the locking for all XDBTX trans uh, operations, even if they go to a different device. So we can always say that we will use the transmit queue lock to this, assigned to this CPU so that we can do per CPU optimizations with the locking, no matter the destination. What else can you do with XDP? You can do an IRA router. Tom worked on that. Um, you can do GRO assist. You can, you could have, uh, you could pre, put together all the metadata and the information you need to, to uh, collapse packets together in a, in a bundle. You could do custom traffic sampling. You could, you could also have customized statistics. You could be like, I want to track every single packet that goes over port 80 from source address foo, bar, and baz, and I want to co collect a whole bunch of statistics in the BPF map that monitor this specific situation. So dynamically, you could upload XDP programs that see if a certain thing is happening for network diagnosis, which I think is really cool. Um, socket pre which is, which I think is really a cool idea. So right now, when we go into the IP stack, we look up 
before we even do a route lookup, we look up if there's a TCP socket. And if there is, we use the route that's installed in the TCP socket to avoid the route lookup. And if anyone's curious, that's why removing the routing cache from the kernel was less expensive than it could have been. In fact, it performance increased when we removed the routing cache because of this hack. But so socket demux eliminates one layer of the stack's overhead, the routing lookup. If we did pre demux all the way in the driver, we'd eliminate all this stuff in between too. So it has a lot of potential for uh, being an incredible optimization, we could almost call directly into the TCP stack from the networking driver and not go through the whole rigmarole of all the layers that sit in between. So this is this has some incredible. So all the people who say I can't get whatever two millisecond latency with TCP receive, we would start getting close into that realm with this if we could go right from the driver receive queue demux to TCP input. I, I, you can't go any further than that except straight to user space, and that's what the RDMA guys go. So I'd be giving you close to RDMA performance without all the side effects of going to RDMA. So I think that's an important thing to understand, that the capabilities that we have XDP are very far-reaching. Okay, so that's the end of XDP, and I want to reiterate two things. XDP is the feature of the year, and DPDK is not Linux. Okay, so now let's move to a more controversial topic, encapsulated protocols. There are lots of names thrown around for this. One is transpose over UDP, protocols in user space, call it what you will. So the basic idea is that we can encapsulate arbitrary transfer protocols such as TCP in a GUE. GUE is a generic UDP encapsulation. It has a a uh, set of headers that it defines after the UDP header, and it has a bunch of f facilities that it can do. Um, and the interesting side note with this is that we can optionally encrypt the traffic as well, because GUE supports encryption of the payload that it's, 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 it's encapsulating. But what happens once you do this is that any user space application can encapsulate TCP and UDP using GUE and implement an entire TCP stack in user space and send it to kernels that understand this GUE encapsulation as well. So the net result is we have TCP stacks in user space because of this encapsulation technology. So what's the motivation? Why do people keep saying that they want something like this? So faster pro propagation of new protocol features. This, this happens over and over again. So Android, at the time that this was proposed, still didn't support TCP fast open, which is important for uh, decreasing the round, number of round trips you have for a TCP connection, um, which is kind of interesting. So the idea is that people would, would push Android apps to Android phones that had this special TCP stack included that would support TCP fast open, for example. Any big vendor could do this because they have the infrastructure and their data center to support GUE TCP connections in their kernels and then push their apps with the special TCP stack that has the updates in it. The theory is that this would be an easier update model than Android. And well, I guess it's setting the standard pretty low. <laughs> but, um, because the problem is Android, Android doesn't move very quickly to new kernel versions. Uh, there's a lot of reasons. It, it, it's a combination of carrier restrictions, uh, the, the handset maker restrictions, and this whole, how this whole ecosystem fits together right now. But anyway, the issue exists, and this is proposed as one possible solution to it. The other one, which I think is kind of interesting, is we could eliminate middle boxes from the equation forever. Because once we start encrypting all of the uh, TCP connections out there and every TCP stream out there is encrypted, the middleware boxes can't analyze the traffic anymore at all. There's nothing they can say about what's in there. So, of course, well, a lot of the middleware box people start get jumping up and down in their seats and they're a little concerned about this. So they've, they've asked for things like, can we add a, an option into the GU headers that says what kind of traffic is being used? And I can't think of anything other than nefarious purposes for that kind of tag. So I don't think that's going to go anywhere. So on the flip side of, well, this is a new thing, maybe, should we let it happen or not, there's precedence for doing this already. Uh, if you look at QUIC, which is uh, the multiplex stream protocol that Google uses in Chrome to uh, accelerate web, uh, web, web transfers, uh, they do 
encapsulate over UDP, and they do all of these things that we're talking about in this part of the presentation. So it's not like this hasn't been done before. It's not like it hasn't been deployed. It's not like someone hasn't tried to deal with all the deployment issues associated with Quick. Uh, so, so it wasn't practical matters once you start doing TOU. Uh, any issue with the GRO and GSO that, that exists with tunnels also exists with TLU because TLU is a tunneling technology. Uh, GSO is mostly a solved problem because uh, one interesting trick that Alex and company have come up with is that, look, if the chip just wants to know where the non-constant headers end and where does the TCP part begin where I need to edit the headers and, and change sequence numbers and do all this kind of stuff. And all we do, normally we would just say, okay, here's the IP header and it's this many bytes and then the TCP happens afterwards. If we just trick the card and say, oh, the IP header is really big, it goes past the UDP header, it goes past the GUI header, and then that's how big the IP header, the IP header is, the chip can offload GSO properly if you do this. So that's an interesting aspect of transmit. GRO is a little bit trickier, and the problem is that once we have the cards doing LRO kind of things, we don't have any way to apply the heuristics that we do for software GRO. It's, it's, it's a seriously complicated problem. There's been talk about EPF programs to do GRO properly. It's an area that's in flux and, and unsure. So anyway, so the thing to understand is that uh, there are offloading issues once you start encapsulating TCP in UDP like this. Okay, check something and the other stuff is, is still kind of straightforward. Um, other TOU issues. ECN is kind of interesting. Who owns the IP ECN bits once TCP sits there underneath the UDP packet? Does the TCP stream or does the tunnel stream own those the ECN bits and the IP header? Open question. Um, congestion control algorithms that are being released recently. We, they simply can't be done in a user space TCP. So anytime someone brings a TCP stack into user space, they start realizing how big the scope of the problem is. And the LKL guys are seeing this as well. You, in order to do BBR properly, you need the fast queuing uh, scheduler, and you need pay, and specifically you need the pacing facilities provided by FQ. You can't. You lose that once you put the TCP stack in the user space. The, the, the packet scheduler sits in the kernel and the TCP thing is sitting in user space and they have no way to communicate pacing information between each other, okay? Um, time or granularity in user space is an issue and this kind of also ties into the thing that is if the app gets scheduled out, that means the whole TCP stack is getting scheduled out too and that means any delay incurred by the application which normally would be considered okay is now affecting network traffic, which may not be okay. Um, which means that being able to suppress an app means you're able to suppress network traffic and the TCP stack from responding. So if a reset came in or a, a data packets came in, they would just get queued up and they wouldn't be act or sacked or processed at all by the TCP stack in the application. So this is another thing that's, that it could be an interesting issue. So then you have another cool thing. So when a TCP stack wants to retransmit a packet because of SAC information, because of other loss indications, or what, or a timer has fired, it does a clever trick. It looks to see if the packet is sitting in the queue disk or the transmit ring of the driver, and if it is, it doesn't try to resend it because it knows that whatever it is in there, once it gets unstuck, it's going to end up getting sent to the network. So sending it again and getting it into this packet that is stuck and backlogged already serves no useful purpose whatsoever. You wouldn't be able to do that in a user land TCP stack. And I'm sure if someone did a full audit, you would find a large list of these kind of things that are impossible in a TCP over UDP stack that are possible with the integration of the TCP stack inside the kernel itself. So that I think these are the things to take into consideration. So this leads us to the, the, the big question. Do you really want TOU? It's going to open up Pandora's box. There really isn't a lot of uh, backtracking we can do once we unleash this beast onto the world. So we really better understand what's going to happen as a side effect once we start doing stuff like this. Um, the, if we knew the full set of fundamental restrictions from my previous few slides, would we be okay with that? We don't know. Uh, so really, this is, this is a really interesting problem space. Uh, and another thing that really occurs to me when I think about this is 
the argument is that we can't update, we can't get the new TCP features. We can't update the kernel fast enough. We can't update. We, the update process is difficult, slow, and I'm thinking. Well, maybe there's a reason for that. As a side effect of all the checking and uh, testing and regression checking and the protection that the kernel provides, it does take time to safely and properly update even a small component of the kernel, like a single module. So are we saying that, yeah, once we put this TCP in user space, we're going to really nearly throw whatever over the wall that we come, with, come up with every day to make performance faster. And we don't have to worry about bugs anymore because what? It crashes the app? That's fine. We can survive that. It's not going to take the whole system out. And I think people maybe would become careless and less careful with what should be a very fundamental aspect of the internet, upgrading it on, on, on machines and user space. I think. I think you can't have it both ways. You can't say that the upgrading TCP carefully is important and at the same time say, I want to upgrade it more quickly. So I don't know where this all goes. So that's all I have to say about TOU and XTP. Uh, I also would like to finish my talk by thanking Hajime-san, Sakia-san, and their team of uh, great people, Jamal, Pablo, everyone who's helped to make this uh, conference uh, the success it's been so far. I think everyone's uh, really enjoying the conference so far and getting a lot of information and uh, interaction with other people. That's helping them a lot. Uh, so I would just like to give a round of applause for all the people who are in the conference. So any questions? They better be good ones. Um. I'm kind of confused. Like you could have, you could have done this in 1979, right? You could have written TCP inside user space, and you could have sent UDP packets. But the receiving end on the server might not under, understand so, the encapsulation. That's the, the, the The implication is that in the data centers, you have a kernel that understands TCP over UDP, and you can update that quickly under your own constraints, under your own controls, outside of the handset ecosystem issues. And then the users would have to get this user land thing. So, so really the question is, do we want to support GRO for people who want to do this? Because if they want to do this, they can do it on the server as well. They can take whatever the 10x performance said. And it's like, ah, you know, whatever. I'm just going to deal with it in, in my On the server side, you, you don't. Because, well, so let's say uh, Big Corp XYZ sends out their app with this TCP and user space thing. All of a sudden, 85 to 90 percent of all the received traffic is this TCP over UDP thing, and they want to GRO that crap. There is no question whatsoever, and they want to be able to. And they want, and then now consider the case where all of your major apps have the TCP and user space thing on your phone. You want to be doing GSO and GRO with that stack too. Do we do we do GRO for quick? The, the geo side on the on the server is not really useful because uh, the clients send uh, at a too low rate anyway. So it's not it's there, but uh, the the aggregation rate is uh, like um, zero dot something. It's very small. But like let's use Facebook as an example. People got to upload them cat pictures, and those cat pictures geo like you wouldn't believe. Uh, not really, because the, the packets are not coming into a single NAPI pool uh, at the server side. Because the server side has like 40 gig NIC and uh, there's no way the sender uh, phone or whatever. This gets to the discussion of do, is, our, is our GRO uh, switching table deep enough? I'm just saying. You only, you only GRO one NAPI budget and you aren't going to get enough of the cat picture in one nappy budget. Right. That's possible. Yeah. But this, okay. One could, uh, one could try to measure the performance impact under a realistic workload and try to make a decision based on that, perhaps. Right. Because if, if GRO, GRO is not going to help, you can already do this in user space on the sender side. You can do it in user space on the receiver side. Well, okay. Then, can we at least agree that on the, on the client side, GSO helps get the cat picture out really quick? No, I don't know. Like, uh, like I don't know that the chips that we want even do anything. 
Right, like, you know, on, on Android? I don't think they... No, software do. GSL. Okay. But, I mean, I don't know. that they, We're really not CPU-bound. It's, you know, we're, we're running on 2G networks, and yeah, you're uploading the cat picture. I mean, there, <laughs> to be honest, there's so many IP tables rules that you have to go through before you even, like, hit the network. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Anything else? Everyone's hungry. <laughs> um, forgive my ignorance, but uh, some questions about the XTP stuff. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, the data end is that that's inclusive? Excuse me. The, the data end pointer and yes, it is inclusive or is one past the end? It's one past the end. One past the end. Okay. Yes. So, uh, so so it's, four it's less data plus n. Okay. And uh, and then um, does it? Uh, I so one know. thing I did, really didn't get into is that the implication for the single page is that uh, there's performance concerns. Uh, and specifically, in most drivers, they, they give pages to the card, and card can chop them up arbitrarily. So you would give like an order one page, and then the card could put several 1500 byte packets into there, and then you would, add, you would amortize the allocation overhead. So now we have this new problem where we have page, page allocation becomes an important performance issue. And Jesper's been doing a lot of work to work on page pools that are really quick and optimal. And right now what a lot of drivers supporting the XDP are doing is they have their own page recycling mechanism that they're using to uh, get rid of the performance loss that you get by going to XDP for normal traffic, for non-XDP traffic. And, and when the uh, EDPF program encounters the packet in this page, does it know how much space in front of the packet if it wants to enlarge it on the front? Very good question. So one of the operations that we were discussing that we want to add is uh, header push and pop. And in order to do that, we have to do something such as say, uh, the chip has to DMA, start the buffer 256 bytes into the page, mm -hmm. and therefore you have 256 bytes of headroom to push and pop headers into. Yes, we've considered that, and we will move towards supporting that kind of feature. Because then you could do TRU and XDP. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. This this has been brought up as well, and that those people haven't are not discoverable at this point. <laughs> the bodies, you mean? That's right. They're in Tokyo Bay right now. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much.